today the topic of the online training session is processing large drone project. Um, so it's going to be a good, a good occasion for me to show you all the different options we have uh, in terms of workflow and processing and processing and how to manage uh, usually large drone project, which are, are composed of, of many thousands of images. Uh, you'll see that there's not only one way to process a large drone project, depending on the output that you want and the numbers of images you're trying to process. Uh, so we'll review those different options. Uh, and also I'll, I will show you some case study on how you can manage uh, your your data set and get the optimal workflow for your own uh, for your own project uh, so today what you will learn i'll start a bit more with the terror uh, 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 collecting a drone imagery uh, optimal uh, uh, the optimal way um, so probably i'll do an overview of, of the requirements we, we we need for for drone project uh, the scope of the project, uh, the GCPs, the overlap, and all, uh, all such parameters. Also, I'll talk about uh, pre-processing requirements, what you should uh, take a look before starting your old, uh, your, your old production um, project. Uh, then we'll review the, the, the three main uh, modules of the software, so the AT part, uh, where we can uh, set the overall accuracy of the project. Then we'll talk about generating DSM, uh, DTMs and then ortho mosaics, uh, how those uh, components can affect the overall output of your project. Uh, finally, we'll, talk, we'll, discuss, we'll discuss a bit about uh, assessing the final ac accuracy of your project. Um, then we'll talk about optimizing processing workflow. So different ways you can approach uh, your, your correlator 3D uh, project uh, based on, on, your, on your situation and maybe the licenses that you have. Uh, and then finally, we'll we'll finish with uh, with case studies and uh, a bit of correlator treaty advantage. Uh, and at the end of this uh, presentation, I'll also take a few questions that we have uh, during this presentation. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to write them in the chat chat box chat box, uh, and I will try as much as possible to answer them at the end of this uh, this presentation. So uh, first of all, the, the first topic of my presentation is collecting optimal drone imagery. So uh, as many of you may know, uh, the the imagery uh, that you get is really the core um, the core of your of your project. Uh, in order to have good results and and uh, if you want to achieve great uh, project with your with your drone imagery, you need to get uh, good data before starting your processing. Uh, and and then you'll 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 uh, you'll really reduce uh, the chance of having uh, any uh, issues during your processing. So before collecting your drone your drone data, you really need to think of what is the co the scopes of your project. So what were you trying to achieve uh, before uh, flying your 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 drone project? So uh, what what are going to be the deliverables? Uh, are you only going to deliver uh, surface model, terrain models, uh, orthos mosaics? Um, is it 3D models, point cloud? So all of those, uh, all of those uh, deliveries will have an impact on probably the ground, the, the ground simple distance you will you will need to fly your project, uh, the area you will need to cover, um, and also what is the accuracy or the overall accuracy you need to you want to reach uh, for your for your um, for your typical uh, project? Uh, because let's say if you want to reach uh, maybe a uh, an absolute accuracy of five centimeters. Well, you need to have the proper GSD to be able uh, to reach uh, such accuracies. So, before uh, flying out your mission, well, you need to address uh, such um, such elements uh, if you want to have uh, if you want to have a good flight configuration. Uh, as for the flight configuration, well, there's many things uh, to be um, to 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 be aware. Um, Usually, the first thing is the overlap uh, for drone project. The minimum requirements is probably 50% uh, side lap, 70% front lap, but that's really the minimum uh, that, that, that you should aim. But uh, personally, I would recommend you aiming even a bit higher than that for drone projects. So having uh, probably around 60% 60, 60 uh, side lap, 80% front, front lap, depending on, on the on the on the texture or on the elements you're trying to map. Let's see if, it, if you're trying to map a dense vegetation, so dense forest, uh, maybe uh, where there's low texture, you maybe want to raise up your overlap to 80% uh, front, 80% side, uh, because it's, it, it, 
will give a bit more redundancy and should help for the for the type one extraction. One thing to keep in mind also, it's always good to have uh, more data than less uh, when you're coming back to the office because it's, it may reduce uh, the amount of time you should spend on your project if you have if you have access to more data uh, than than tying uh, manually some images because you have less uh, overlap. So that's one thing. Um, one thing to keep in mind. Uh, other thing, when you're flying, uh, when you're flying your your project, uh, it's always good to have a, as much as possible a constant uh, ground sample distance throughout your project. So if if it's possible, well, uh, there's there, there's some uh, there's some uh, flying app that allows uh, some follow terrain uh, options for uh, for for flying your your UAV. Well, if it's possible, you should use uh, you should use such uh, such features. Also, when you're when you're mapping really large uh, large areas with drones, uh, sometimes it it can be good to to see uh, to have like one big polygons for the AOI to see what what should be the um, what should be the the total flying time of the project. But if the if the, the the areas of interest is starting to get a bit complex, it can be good to break down your whole uh, your whole areas of interest in some smaller section and do multiple flights. Um, this uh, should really reduce um, uh, probably the numbers of images uh, that that you will need to to process. Uh, it should help also for the for the the the, the battery time uh, since. It's easier to manage smaller block than one big block of images. Uh, so yeah, so breaking down those uh, small, your, your big block in smaller section, and also uh, having those smaller section uh, individual groups when you're gonna create your project. Uh, also, uh, coverage wise, well, you should overshoot your area just a bit. So you don't want you you want to make sure that you have uh, more coverage than your uh, areas of interest. This way, you'll make sure that on the side of your project, you'll make sure that you have a full coverage uh, when time to deliver uh, final, uh, final, cost, uh, final output. Uh, so that's one other uh, one other element that we that should be considered. Um, as for um, as for ground control points, that's a question we 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 typically uh, have quite a lot uh, often. Uh, the ground control points should be well distributed over your 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 areas of interest. Um, as much as possible, so you have uh, they're, they're they're sitting nicely on on the block of images. Uh, also, they should they should be uh, at least fifty feet from the boundary uh, of your of your project because if you're if the ground control points are really standing on the side of the of your of the project, well there 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 can be in areas where you're only gonna see it for, for one or two or three images. Uh, it's it's always good to have a ground control points where you can see. Where you can see it from uh, from uh, from any point of view, because it's going to give a bit more weight to this uh, to this ground to this ground control points uh, when we're going to perform the bundle adjustment. Um, as for hardware configuration, well, there's probably a few things here uh, to 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 have in mind when you're if you want to survey large areas with drones. Uh, it's probably good to maybe have a, a fixed wings since you can you can uh, you can probably cover uh, larger areas uh, at a faster time. Uh, so for large areas, usually fixed wings uh, are more suited. Um, also, you maybe have as much as possible a, a larger sensor since uh, you should cover more ground flying at the high a higher altitude. Also, if if uh, if the ground sample distance uh, allows you, uh, that should be something uh, something interesting because you're gonna fly. If you're flying higher, well, you cover uh, more ground or more coverage in less amount of time. Uh, also, as much as possible, trying to to have uh, cameras that avoid fisheye lens. Uh, so, and even rolling shutter uh, rolling shutter effects. So those are uh, th those are are things that we 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 would like to. Uh, we would like to to, to keep out of um, out of uh, the, our project. Um, also, uh, one thing that's really important when it comes to time to 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 acquiring the images is getting the, the camera parameters uh, properly based on the lightning condition that you have these days. A lot of flying apps are going to use uh, automatic configuration for their cameras. 
Well, sometimes those camera, uh, those settings are not optimal to the flying condition. Uh, you have, uh, you, have, you have your, uh, for, for the day you're flying. So sometimes really uh, take a look at the shutter speed, the ISO. Um, so those are, are key factors to have uh, really sharp imagery and not blurry images. Uh, also, you can you can probably do a, a quick QC uh, in the field to make sure that the parameters you've set uh, once once you've did a, a small test uh, are are good for the rest of the for, for the rest of the of the project. Uh, and also, if it's possible, well, the time you're gonna fly uh, as much as possible closer to noon, maybe from 10 to 2. Uh, this really reduce uh, the the shadow the, the possibility of shadow on the images, well, uh, which can decrease uh, sometimes the, uh, the overall output from your photogrammetric data. Uh, and then finally, the last thing for the from the GPS perspective is you want to have, uh, I assume you want to have uh, maybe a good timestamps from the, the GPS and the, the image coordinates. Uh, so this way you'll make sure that you don't have, um, you don't have any uh, timestamp shift uh, between your images if you want if you want to have higher accuracy you can always rely on uh, rtk or ppk correction uh for your drones uh also you can use more gcps uh, if you want to if you want to ensure a higher accuracy based on the final uh, delivery you need to have for your project now uh, just a a few pre-processing requirements and how you can manage data uh, before starting your whole uh, photogrammetric processing, uh, well, the first thing is: uh, is it good? Is it good to do one project versus multiple project? Technically, Correlator 3D is able to manage uh, really, really large data sets, um, really large data set uh, in a single project. So you should be able to run uh, a fairly big amount of data uh, in one single AT, and then you can split your project according uh, on subsection if you want, which we will talk a bit later uh, in this presentation. Uh, but sometimes if you're if you're flying constantly uh, on multiple days, but you want to start maybe your uh, your your production earlier uh, er earlier than your your last day of flight. Well, what what you can do is you can then run probably one block of images and then use the output of this block to tie uh, to tie the the the, the subsequent block uh, of of your project. So that's one way you can approach uh, multiple project wise. Uh, but uh, we typically suggest to run 180 uh, on all the images. This uh, should really reduce uh, the, the 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 amount of of, of uh, potential issues uh, for the orthos or the or the DSM. Uh, also, if you want to manage large data set, it's probably a good way to start by taking a, a, a smaller sample sets uh, that represent the overall project you're trying to achieve, and maybe run some tests on this. So you can you can make some tests on the on the the grid sample uh, from your DSM on the level of automation you want to reach, uh, maybe for the DTM algorithm, uh, the resolution of the orthos, uh, maybe also the size of your project. So how much size uh, it, it, it should reach, uh, that's something you can probably see uh, with a sample set, uh, with a sample test. Uh, and also, a, a sample test can help you to, to script out uh, the whole processing of your project if you really want to have a, a fully automated option. Uh, also, pre-processing reminders, uh, maybe just before starting your project, make sure that your GPU drivers are up to date. Uh, this way you'll ensure that you'll get the most out of your hardware machine. Uh, the storage capacities, um, when managing large data set, that's something uh, quite quite important. Data can be uh, really, uh, can have a lot of data uh, quickly. With uh, our latest version, it's something that we've tried to, to, to focus a bit more. So especially for the ortho and the mosaic, which are usually the, the areas where, where a lot of data is get created. Uh, you can use compression options if you want to really reduce the size uh, of your project where sometimes uh, size on disk is matter. Uh, also having maybe SSD drive uh, instead of normal hard drive uh, should help to really speed up uh, the whole processing, uh, the whole processing uh, pro options of your project. Uh, as of licensing options, depending on 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 your 
on your situation, if you have access to maybe one or more license, uh, there's some way to, to, to have a parallel approach. So if you're doing an 80 on the whole block, and then you want to you want to split out the, the surface model into multiple instances. Well, there's 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 way that you can you can manage your production on on many computers. Uh, even also for streamlining the thing, at, as we will review at the end of this presentation. And then uh, probably the last thing is what the level of, of automation you want to get for your uh, for your project. Uh, do you want to go uh, with the GUI approach where you really get a, a good a good and a quick uh, visual uh, representation of your project, or you really want to get everything, um, everything scripted out uh, as a big production tool. Uh, so sometimes when when you're getting a, a workflow uh, similar to every project, it can be it can be good to script out this workflow, uh, and it should really uh, reduce the amount of time you should you should spend uh, on on the GUI interface. So now let's jump a bit more into the the practical part of the of the processing of processing the project. So as I said before, the um, the photogrammetric workflow is is brought down is is divided into three modules. Uh, the first one, which I think is the most important one, it's the aerial triangulation. So it's this part where we're gonna basically uh, it's divided into two parts. So the tie point extraction and then the bundle adjustment. So it's really there where the uh, the the Kind of the magic uh, going to appear. So we're going to tie all the images together um, to make sure that we have a nice block of images. Uh, we can then incorporate ground control points if you want to refine the overall accuracy um, of, of your project. And then we, we take all those elements together and try to come with a final solution where we can derive a surface model, terrain model, uh, orthos, mosaics, 3D models, point cloud. And it's probably the, the 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 module where you should spend uh, at least most of your time for the QC part because it really uh, it really uh, relies for your uh, accuracy of your project so once your AT is done uh, you want to carefully review the AT report uh, probably the quality report uh, the EAO folder if you want to have more information about the overall accuracy of your project so if we jump uh, into the software. So basically here you have uh, the overall uh, view of our uh, graphical user interface. So uh, so the, the software is built as a modular architecture. And then here you're going to have the uh, aerial triangulation module. And then once, uh, so as I said, it was breaking down into two parts. So the first part is basically uh, the type one extraction. What you want to make sure with the type one extraction is that you have a nice spider webs of link. So all the image are nicely tied together. Uh, this way you'll make sure that um, that you don't gonna have some images that are pulling uh, the solution apart from where it should be. Uh, so as much as possible when you review, uh, first thing when you review the, the, the tie points, you maybe wanna take a look at the overall distribution of the links that most of the images need to be tied together. Um, it's it's not a hundred percent necessary that all the images are tied together. Sometimes in area where there's denser vegetation, maybe you can have a, a few missing links between uh, images from from flight lines to flight lines. But overall, you want to have as much as possible all the images attached uh, into the same flight line and also between flight lines. Then uh, once you 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 make sure that that all this uh, all this is nicely attached together. Uh, you can import your ground control points. Uh, in this case, we have uh, four uh, four ground control points and then one checkpoints. Uh, the ground control points uh, are are gonna take the solution and drift it to the coordinate that we have uh, in order to have a, a final absolute accuracy. And then the checkpoint can be there only to validate if the overall solution is um, is good. And then uh, for the bundle adjustment. Uh, depending on, on, on what you have for for drone project, uh, you can leave uh, typically uh, the parameters as they are here. So you want to let the software compute the overall position of the images. You want to let the software calibrate the sensor and you want to use ground control points as uh, as um, as ground reference. Again, ground control points are not necessary in your project, but if you have access to it's a it's a it's a plus value uh, because they're going to help or they're going to uh, they're going to enhance the overall absolute accuracy of your project. 
So once the bundle adjustment is performed, uh, what you want to do is you want to review uh, the quality report of your project. So you're going to have here uh, basically uh, on the first page an overall summary. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the quality report. We have on our website more webinars that, that covers those specific topics uh, much more in details. But overall, what, what you want to look is you want to make sure that the overall relative, uh, the relative adjustment of the block is good. So all the, all the image are, are tied together. Uh, it, you want to have a, a, an excellent quality assessment. If you have some ground control points, well, you want to make sure that uh, the ground control points residual and the checkpoint residual really fits your needs here uh, in terms of, uh, of, of accuracy. Uh, also, um, well, we're going we're gonna to review the options that were used. And there's many more options, uh, many more information about uh, the overall uh, statistics of the, of, the, um, of the AT part. Uh, you can also here review uh, basically the, um, the ground control points analysis. So that's another thing uh, probably you want, you want to take a look at to make sure that all your ground control points uh, fit the, the final solution. Uh, if you want to really dig more a bit uh, into, the, um, into the analysis of your AT, uh, you can always review uh, the EO folder that is located into your, uh, into your project, um, which uh, have more reports about uh, all statistics. So if you open your EIO folder, well, you're going to have all other files about the ground control points, the image, uh, the image residual. So th those are all other files you can you can take a look at uh, if you want to have uh, more uh, understanding about your overall uh, arrow triang tri triangulation solution. So now, once the arrow triangulation is done. Uh, you're sure that you have uh, you have you have met the overall accuracy requirements with your ground control points. Uh, you can you can go to the next step, which is basically uh, generating surface terrain model and point cloud based on your images. Um, so uh, this probably will be the the, the, the most time-consuming part of your project since. Uh, generating sur uh, surface model sh may take usually around probably 40, I would say for 30 to 40 percent of the whole project uh, project time should be uh, sh should be uh, taking for generating DSMs um, and DTM. For um, for surface model, well, there's there's uh, there's probably two uh, input requirements. First of it is the proper overlap. Uh, if you're if you, if you flown your project with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, the proper uh, the proper configuration and the proper overlap, you should you should uh, not need to have any uh, any uh, playing with parameters here. Uh, you don't want to have a higher overlap than maybe ninety percent because if you're raising up too much the the front overlap. Specific, specifically for your uh, for the DSM generation, well, you reduce uh, the vertical uh, you you sorry the vertical uncertainty of your uh, final DSM uh, will be higher than if you're using maybe a seventy percent or eighty percent uh, front lap because when we're matching a race together, well, it 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 uh, it, it getting a, a higher uncertainty. So having overlap up to Maximum ninety percent for your for your DSM, uh, so that should be uh, sufficient. If some is for any instance, maybe you have images that are really really closer uh, one to each other. You can you can sometimes disable uh, one or few images. Uh, you want to use parallel flight lines. Also, grid patterns sometimes can help for uh, for the surface generation. So um, you don't want to have something that's manually flown. Um, that will help for the um, for the uh, for the overall uh, surface and terrain model. Um, as for the resolution, uh, you want to set the vertical accuracy based on your on your needs. If you really want to have accurate data and you want to have the you have the the surface model that fits your ground control point, you can set uh, the vertical accuracy to maximal uh, when generating the sur the surface model. As for the grid spacing. Well, what we typically uh, suggest for our customers is uh, with drone data, you can go uh, optimal way. It's five times the ground sample distance. But uh, if you really want to have a sharper DSM, 
and processing time is not it's not your your main uh, your main concern you can go up to three times the ground sample distance uh so this should uh, this should really give you sharp uh sharp uh, outputs for your uh, for your surface uh, for your surface model again before launching a, a larger dsm uh, on the on on a big area you can you can it's always good to try on the smaller sections to see that uh, that that Three times the ground support distance uh, fit what you what you would like to produce as an output, and then again uh, as uh, digital terrain extra extraction, um, well, there's there's a few way to approach uh, this uh, this feature. You can either let the software fully extract uh, fully extract the terrain model, and then you can do QC on 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 some part. Uh, to make sure that you have to make sure that you have um, you have proper uh, terrain model, or you can also draw a bit of exclusion zone on some areas that you want uh, that you want to that you want to have uh, that you want to keep intact into your terrain model. Uh, also, one thing that we typically do in house when when we when we uh, analyze our final terrain model is when you. When you derive, uh, let's say your uh, your your uh, surface model and then the, your terrain model from it, you can you can use uh, the DEM expen uh, uh, the DEM uh, inspection tools, which uh, will basically ask you what uh, what um, basically what uh, DEM you want to use and what ground control points uh, what ground control points you are using, so you can. By using your DTM and then your ground control points, you can see if uh, once the terrain model is extracted, well, your ground control point still fits uh, your 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 terrain model, and there's not too much smoothing. If uh, if for any instance maybe uh, there, there there's ground there's one point that that is slightly over uh, your 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 level of confidence, you can go at, at those area and maybe. Uh, take a look uh, and draw some exclusion zone if if it's a stockpile if it's a if it's a bridges um, so this is probably a good way to 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 see if uh, if more editing or or, or need, needs to be done on the overall um, on the overall uh, terrain model. Also, uh, one thing I haven't uh, I haven't said is if you want to run smaller section of your of your project. So let's say you've run your AT on your full project, but you want to make some tests on smaller section. You can always disable some images in in your project tree. So you can select a complete flight line like this, and then use the disable flight line. And you can see that those flight line will become grayed out. So once I'm gonna launch. The, the DM the DSM or the DTM extraction or even the ortho the ortho part well those images won't be taking in account in the in the processing but they will they will still be kept in the project so uh, once I'm done my test and I want to run it on the all on the on the, the the big part well I can then uh, I can then uh, reable back those images um, so that's one way to approach uh, smaller sample sets. Now on the on the production the, the production of the ortho mosaic, well, uh, sometimes when we manage large data sets, um, it can be uh, it it there's there's can be many uh, many choices to have. The first thing is, uh, do I want to have a classic ortho versus a true ortho? So based on uh, the based on on the analysis you want to perform on your uh, on your um, on your final mosaics where you need to choose between uh, the classic or the true ortho. So the classic ortho is basically an ortho that generated from the terrain model and the true ortho is, a, is an ortho that is derived from the surface model. So um, so all the pixels are aligned to the to the, the surface model and and it's, it's like if I was looking at the uh, image from above. Um, Typically, we suggest uh, to, to, to derive classic ortho as they give uh, usually better visual um, effect over the final, uh, over the final project, product. But if you want to manage uh, true ortho, well, that's totally possible. Um, and so uh, 
one thing to see if you can derive a true ortho or a classic ortho is once you're in the graphical user interface, well, depending on the model you're going to choose into your project tree, uh, it's going to be the one used for uh, for the um, for the ortho rectification. So if I use the uh, surface model, well, uh, I can then derive uh, here the the, the DSM base. However, if I want to do some classic ortho, I can then uh, select the terrain option and then derive uh, and then derive uh, orthos from the from the the, the terrain model. Um, again, you you also have uh, a few a few other options if you want to crop out your images. One thing that that uh, maybe uh, can be interesting if you're pressing large data set, large drone data set, uh, you can also add a compression into the into the single ortho. So this will uh, really reduce the size on disk of your images if disk space is a uh, is an issue uh, in your in your case. Uh, then uh, here, once the orthos are generated, well, we're gonna we gonna we gonna have for each individual images. We're gonna have one single file, and then uh, those uh, different ortho can be uh, can, can be now mosaic together. Uh, how to manage orthos and mosaic folder? Well, once you generate for uh, your ortho, the orthos are are um, are stored in uh, typically in the ortho folder. So in your correlator 3D project, um, in your correlator 3D project. Well, uh, I'm going to have an ortho folder and then a mosaic folder. So once I run the ortho, all the orthos will be stored uh, here. But again, if I want if I want to have another set of ortho, maybe because I want to try on the, on the DSM, I can create a new folder of, of ortho and then change the specific uh, folder that belongs in my project tree. And I will be able to have two sets of ortho. So this way, if I want to compare uh, either the true ortho versus the classic ortho, that's one way you can do it. So same thing with uh, the mosaic. The mosaic. So um, so you can always change directories for mosaic, and uh, depending on on the ortho sets that you want to use uh, for your final uh, for your final project, so you can quickly uh, you can quickly see the difference between a true and a classic ortho. Uh, also, if you want to, if when you're managing a large production and you want to run sub sample or sub sections of, of mosaic, uh, it can be good to have different uh, ortho folders for, for different uh, mo mosaic parts. Uh, it's, it's probably going to help uh, managing the, 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 the GUI if you want to, if you want to load a, a big amount of, of orthos. So that's one way uh, you can, you can, you can take a look at it. Um, also, if you want, uh, as I've shown for the uh, for the flight line, you can disable individual ortho uh, if you want to if you want to process a smaller section. Sometimes, uh, maybe for any reason, when you're when when you have acquired your images, uh, some images were more brighter or darker uh, than other images, um, or you can you can use uh, you can use the disabling option for for specific images images, and this should help. Uh, to color balance the final the final mosaic. Uh, also, we have a modules once the mosaic is fin fi finally created. Uh, well, we have a modules to edit uh, the overall seam line. So once you, you once you make sure that you have a good mosaic, you can you can pan through your mosaic here and then make sure that that uh, that it, it fits your need. Your ground control points uh, are are under marker. And then you can edit the overall seam line of the project. Um, and then finally, for deliveries, uh, if you want to manage large data set, well, it'd probably be a good idea to tile the final product because sometimes, well, um, well, uh, large data set can be a, a few amount of gigs. When if when you're loading in into uh, maybe GIS software, it can be hard to handle. So having smaller tiles, smaller tiles can be uh, can be uh, something uh, good for for deliveries. Um, so I'll show you that uh, in a moment. So once you want to export with a tiling scheme, you can you can go into the export options and you can use a, a tiling scheme here. So it can be a poly, uh, it can be a shape file that contains polygon. And the thing is, they need to have an uh, an attribute uh, in their attribute table that has the name, uh, and then this the, this is the name we will use for the uh, for the naming convention of the tiles. 
Also, you can add the, the, the JPEG compression in your final mosaic if you want to reduce the final size on disk. Uh, so, yeah. Finally, once you're ready to deliver, you want to do you want to assess the final accuracy of your project. Well, basically, you want to pan through your mosaic. You want to make sure that you don't have too much color adjustments to do. Uh, you can play with the final uh, histogram if you want to. If you want to maybe have a sharper mosaic uh, because it was probably more darker be because of the sun when it, when the image was required. Uh, you can also pan to make sure that your ground control points uh, are. Um, are fits your mosaic, and then you want to pan to see that there's no seam lines that maybe cross uh, any buildings and, 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 and any uh, other uh, things like that. So, uh, so yeah, so again, just pan, and then you can see, like in this case, where the, the final uh, the final ground control points really uh, fits the, the, the middle of the marker uh, in this case. So you can just visually do a, do a QC uh, do a QC before uh, ending out the, the the final product to your uh, to your customers. So now, uh, just a, a a bit of a review on the on the workflow options. So there's many ways to split a correlator 3D project if you're managing really large data set. So the first one is if you're managing uh, many ten ten thousand of images, if, and if you want to probably split, split the block before the 80. Uh, one thing to, con to consider is if you want to do so, uh, you need to have ground control points, uh, common ground control points between block of images. So let's say this will be your first project and then this will be your second project. You should need to have an overlap between, the, between those projects. Um, and then uh, that's that should should uh, should be able to to fit your both block together. Uh, one thing we've done uh, is sometimes when when you're you're acquiring data uh, quite often, but you want to get your your production started before uh, it, before the end of the last flight, you can process your first flight, then 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 do all your processing, and then from there uh, you can take the output of the first project and use them as um, ground reference for the second project. So what you can do is you can, uh, in Correlator 3D, uh, you can uh, load in, load uh, uh, a reference ortho and then a reference DEM. And when you're going to do the AT, basically, uh, we've added a function uh, in, in, in our latest version where you can, you can basically uh, add the ground control points based on the feature that are loaded in your project tree. So if you have a reference ortho and a reference DEM, you can select this option here, and uh, wherever you're gonna click on your uh, on on your on your uh, on your screen. So let's say if I'm selecting here in this case a DSM. So wherever you're gonna click uh, here in this case, well, you're gonna have uh, the GCP window that will open, and you will be you will be able to, to, to tag your ground control points. So if you're having uh, a reference or two and a reference them, well, it's, it's a quick way, uh, or even LiDAR data, it's a quick way to register all your project together uh, and make sure that they should fit uh, at the end, at the end. So uh, this is probably a, a, an approach where you're gonna have a constantly amount of data that will come in. Uh, that's one way you can, you can maybe split your project before. Uh, however, the the best case scenario would be uh, would be the second one here, where you want to split your project after the AT. So you've done uh, all your your imagery collection, you're ready to go. So you're gonna do the AT on the big block. Um, so you make sure that all the images are tied together. They're all using the same ground control points. And then if you have access to multiple licenses, you can split up the project. So you can take a part of the project export the EO and the camera file once the AT is done on a second, on a second computer and then run the DSM, ortho, uh, DSM, DTM and ortho on both computers and then combine the orthos for the mosaic creation. So that's another way uh, you, can, you can approach, you can approach your, uh, your, your project. Finally, the last way you can probably split a correlator 3D is probably uh, when you're gonna do seamline editing so sometimes for large project, uh, we manage the, mo the the mosaic creation in multiple blocks. So you may you may see um, 
you may see in this case uh, many many blocks. Uh, like in this case, I only have one, but sometimes if the project is getting really large, well, you can have multiple blocks of Mosaic. So if your project is stored on a server or on the computer that is accessible from, from many computers, well, different users uh, that can access to the project can edit simultaneously different blocks of Mosaic. So this could help uh, to have a faster way to, uh, to edit the overall theme line of the project. Uh, so that's that's one way. Another thing that can really reduce the amount of theme lines uh, editing uh, we've added on to our, our, our latest software. I haven't talked too much about this feature, but uh, when you're using maybe fixed wing or, or projects that are flown quite high, um, even medium or large frame uh, project, you can, you can derive, um, so before the mosaic creation, you can select your surface model uh, into, your, uh, into your project tree. And during the mosaic creation, well, you can use the, the, the DM for seamline avoidance. So this will kind of compute a height map and try as much as possible to cross the seam line where um, where uh, there's no parallax at all. So that's that's one way uh, to really reduce for for dense urban area. This could save you uh, quite a lot of time uh, for uh, for for seam line editing. Now. To finish this presentation, I'll probably just show you uh, smaller cases um, and, and see how you can handle uh, such projects. So I know the subject of my presentation is processing large data set, but typically for a smaller project, so let's say uh, below 100, below 1,000 images, or it, can, it can be run from the GUI interface. Uh, the processing time can be quite, uh, quite it's beside the below one day, everything can be, uh, can be generated for smaller project. It can be flown in the morning, then process in the afternoon, then deliver ready to be delivered at the end of the uh, at the end of the day. Um, so few inter interactions should be uh, required if some ground control points are used. Uh, however, uh, since it's a smaller project, all the QCs can be done at the end or at the AT part, and then at the end of the project, uh, it can be run on the on the smaller on the sm smaller uh, laptop. Um, then here for larger project where sometimes it's flown on multiple mission, uh, it can be good to have for each mission individual groups. So this uh, should give more flexibility to the aerial triangulation part. So sometimes if you're managing a large a large area and you break down your your, your flying. Um, your, your 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 flying time into smaller blocks. Well, you, for each block, you should uh, you should have a, a different groups um, because it's going to have a different calibration for each uh, for for each cameras. Uh, depending on the numbers of images that you have, well, this uh, this way of this approach can be done from project maybe up to ten thousand of images. So for each group, you you can have you can have. Uh, so for each flying uh, flight, you can have uh, one group. Uh, this will really reduce uh, or give more flexibility, and it should uh, it should be uh, a good workflow to use. Um, depending on the output that you want, if your final output is only maybe um, maybe a, a final ortho mosaic, well, the ground the the surface model and the terrain model, the resolution can be raised up uh, quite a bit, so you can maybe go. Up to ten times the ground sample distance. If it's only for the ortho processing part that you that that you need, um, so uh, so yeah, um, the hardware. Well, on a standard PC, you should be you should be good to run uh, such project. Um, on the graphical uh, on the GPU side, probably something around uh, higher than the, than the the 1060 or even the new RTX series from from Nvidia. Should be you should be uh, re really good to go uh, on the RAM side. Eight gig would probably be the minimum, but uh, twelve up to thirty two gig you should be uh, you should be you should be good uh, good enough. Yeah. Um, sometimes uh, you flown project with with discontinuous area. Um, well, if it's a big hole in between project in between those projects. Well, sometimes you can you can. It's a good way to, to process those projects individually, since they're they're they are not uh, they are not uh, 
highly um, they're not connected. Um, if you want, you can also batch process the um, the project creation. Uh, if you want to to have a, a quicker approach, uh, you can use a convert EO function. Uh, I suggest you review our webinar we did on streamlining large large project. That's uh, one way we you can learn on scriptings. Um, so depending on the size of the project, uh, it can be uh, you can run one project then do a then do your QC while the second one is running. Uh, so that's that's one way to run uh, to run to run data and such as project like this uh, for the hardware it should be similar as the project too. And then finally, uh, for the last for the last drone project. So if you're if you're flying maybe like big big project, uh, more than ten thousand images. Uh, if you want, you can try as much as possible to do the eighty in one block, and then probably divide your project into smaller section uh, if you want to. In this case. Uh, it was flown in probably 48 blocks. So each of those smaller section were was a block was a block. So for typically for each for each uh, each of those blocks, it should be a different group uh, since it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna give a bit more flexibility to the um, to the AT. Um, so this can up to 10,000 images. It can take many days to to, to process. Uh, especially for the DSM, the orthos, and the mosaic creation, one thing can be good is taking a, t taking um, or maximizing the overnight and weekend processing. So you can do your QC during the day uh, or or all the editing during the day. But once you before leaving uh, leaving for, for for the day, maybe launch uh, the ortho or the mosaic creation uh, so that uh, it should run it should run uh, overnight. Also, uh, if you want to run multiple module. Overnight, you can then you can you can uh, you can run section of scripts, uh, so it should uh, it should uh, help you for having a, a sufficient uh, or a good workflow. So finally, just to wrap things up, uh, well, correlator 3D uh, can bring unit benefits. So, for, for as probably many of you may know as well, we have an unmatched processing speed. We have a solution that. Uh, that that fits for kind of everyone. Uh, so from from the beginner in photogrammetry and to the uh, I N uh, users in photogrammetry, uh, all the all the solution is is, um, is customizable. Uh, we can present really large data sets in in a quickly manner of, of time. So it's it can be a good production tool if you want to chunk out uh, big data sets. Uh, it can be run uh, on the cloud, maybe on AWS on, on Azure. Uh, everything can be uh, can be uh, scripted out from the command prompt. So if you're getting a, a really advanced user and you want to get uh, you want to get things going uh, really quick, well, everything can be scripted out uh, can be scripted out for um, for for big production uh, for production tool. Um, Uh, also, uh, as uh, licensing options, well, we have a monthly, yearly, permanent license. We have different types of uh, license formats, so UAV, medium, satellite format. We offer node lock, floating license. Uh, so again, if you want to get started with Correlator 3D, you can always write us uh, at sales.simactive.com. We offer free processing for marketing purposes. Uh, and also, you can download a, a two weeks free trial on our website, www.simactive.com. Mm -hmm.